God's house on this morning. But listen, here we're going to get right on into our word this morning. Praise the Lord. Turn with me, if you will, amen, to the book of Judges again. And we're going to look at chapter number 8. We're going to deal with verse number 22 through verse number 35. A little reading, uh, but I thought that it would be important for us to make sure that we go over this so that we can understand what it is that we are attempting to say. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Judges, the 8th chapter, we're going to look at verse number So it says from the New King James translation of the Bible, uh, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your sons and your grandson also. You have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. He said, the Lord shall rule over you. 24 says, Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you, that each of you would give me the earring from his plunder. But they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, We were glad to give them. And they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it, it the earrings from his plunder. Verse 26 says, Now the weight of the gold earring that he requested was 1,700 shekels, which is approximately 43 pounds, pounds of gold, beside the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were, that were around the camel's neck. Then Gideon made it into an ephod, and set it upon, or set it rather, in his city, Ophrah. And all the, all Israel rather, played the hearted with it. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted their head no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Verse 29 says, Then Jeroabel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son whose name was called Abimelech. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died, the Bible says, at a good old age was buried in the tomb of Joash's father in Ophir of the Asbirites. And it was so, as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel, again, the Bible says, played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bereth their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you again on this morning that you bless us to be in your house. We ask you, dear God, to minister to each of us. We pray that your will will be done. We ask you right now, God, to open us up, pour into us that which we are in need of, in order for us to have a better understanding of what happening in, in Gideon's life as well as what goes on in our lives. We ask you, dear God, to bless us now in the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Uh, before I get into this, uh, we got one more day of consecration. Somebody say one more day. Amen. One more day of consecration for those of you that are you know, giving yourselves to God in that manner. Amen. We got one more day. Praise the Lord. All right. So Judges, the uh, eighth chapter, verse number 33 is the key verse. So it was so as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the bells and made Baal bear 
regret their God. Tell somebody, remember who brought you through what you came through. Remember who brought you through what you came through. Amen. And this morning, by the grace of God, we are going to conclude in our series. Um, we call this series, Be Strong. And I want to talk from a message that we've entitled, Don't Go Backwards, God Has Moved You Forward. Tell somebody, don't go backwards, God has moved you forward. Tell somebody else, don't go backwards, God has moved you forward. Amen. Come on, give God a hand of praise. Praise the Lord. Amen. We've just read an all so familiar story. The season, the segment, the picture of Israel depict what I consider as a repetitive response and reaction of Israel's journey. They continue to repeat it. It was their response quite often, and many times we find ourselves doing the same thing. In my humble opinion, it actually speaks of Israel's plight condition, their situation, and again we find ourselves in the same kind of pattern, if you will. So oftentimes we, without doubt, we know that God has moved in our hearts. We know that God has given to us something that can give us direction. We know that God Many times in our lives, we know that God has written something on the table of our hearts. I mean, we, we know undeniably, we know verifiably that God is with us and God is saying some things to us. Amen. And then we make a turn. We make that turn after we've seen the power of God. We make that turn after we've seen the strength of God. We make that turn after we've understood the wisdom of God. We make that turn. Amen? And the turn is not a good turn. The turn is not going to be better for us. The turn so many times is something that causes us to become worse often what we were before. Someone say going back. It's not uncommon for people to turn and go back. As a matter of fact, we are familiar. You think about where you've come from. I'm quite familiar with my past. Every person in here is quite familiar with all of their past. I can remember things in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth, all through high school. I can remember things way back then, and all those things were part of my past. You must understand, amen? And see, the past are the things that happened to us. Those were the things that we were a part of. The past were those things that we got ourselves involved in. We were engaged in our past. Are y'all here? Praise the Lord. But when it comes to our future, the future, in my opinion, is like an undiscovered box on a shelf that once you see it on the shelf, you grab it, and now because you don't know what's actually in it, you have to begin going through it in order for you to find out what's in it. And many times, because we don't know what our future holds, so oftentimes what we find ourselves doing is we just, you know, because I really don't want to face what's forward in my future, I prefer going back because, again, I'm familiar with my past and I don't know anything about my future. Praise the Lord. The future is what's going to eventually happen. The future might have some things that could happen that you don't know about, that I don't know about when it comes to the future. Are y'all here, praise the Lord? And many people get frightened about their future. 
They don't understand that their future can be much better for them, but because I don't know anything about it, it can kind of freeze you. It can kind of paralyze you. It can kind of cause you to become petrified because I don't know what my future holds. Well, here we have the man, the hewer. Somebody say the hewer, the destroyer. Talking about Gideon. Gideon, again, as we left off on last Sunday, he had been given 300 qualified military men to work with him to go up against the enemy of God. 300 men. And based upon God's numbering system, a numerical system, 300 was enough for this man and the military guys, soldiers that were with him to go up against all of these enemies. And so the historical account of the battle begins, church, in, in Judges 7, chapter, verse number 20, where the 300 men, based upon the instructions of Gideon, of course, Gideon got the instructions from God. Gideon told him to simply duplicate everything that I'm doing. Somebody say duplicate. In other words, I do not want you guys to do anything at all out there that I'm not doing I want you all to duplicate everything that you guys see me doing. I want you all to do the same thing. And so here it is, brothers and sisters. What happened was, they, the Bible told us or tells us that, that Gideon actually separated the men into groups of 100. Three groups, 100 men equal 300 men. And everything, praise the Lord, that Gideon was doing, he wanted to make sure that every man, all of the rest of the soldiers were doing the exact same thing. I consider that as mentorship in the face of the Midianites. Because he did not tell them what was going to happen. He said, whatever I do, I just need you guys to do the same thing. And at times like these, if you're going to really get things done in your home, in your lives, around you, in the church, we need to have the process of duplication in order for us to go to God's destination. Are y'all here? Praise the Lord. And with this, you must understand these men were so involved in, in what was going on because they were the last 300 that were left. You remember how it was. The story said that there were 22,000 men and because God began to test those that were around him, you must understand this, this, the group narrowed down. All the way to 10,000, you remember, praise the Lord. And then now we are left with 300 men to go up against the Midianites. And so if anybody going to get this job done, these guys must prepare their mind, their hearts, their souls to get it done. Are y'all here? Praise the Lord. So now, he told them what we're going to do. We're going to march to the outer bank of the camp of the Midianites. And whenever I move to the outer banks, we're not going to invade their territory. We're just going to line up just the 300 of us, and we're going to look at their entire platoon. It's only 300 men, church. Are y'all here? Only 300 men against 135,000 men. And the 300 that God said, now you guys are the ones that's going to get it done. I want you all to just get right to the end of the, the, the brink of the camp and just look at the platoon, look at the army, look at the soldiers, look at the, 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 the horses, look at all of that stuff. And I want you guys to prepare yourselves to do whatever I do. Because he realized that he's going to get his direction from the Lord. And of course, the God had already told him, I've already, what, delivered the Midianites into your hand. But all I need you guys to do is prepare yourself to duplicate, to be a copycat, to, to mimic everything that I say for you to do. And we're going to get this thing done. 
Could you imagine if a church, you'll understand, was to do everything that leadership told them to do? I wonder would there be any stop in us? And so here it is, brothers and sisters, uh, Gideon gets all the way to the brink of the camp, and now the rest of the men are doing the same thing. And he tells them what he wants them to do. I want you guys to put a trumpet in your right hand, and I want you to put a pitcher in your left. Check it out. I want you to put a trumpet in your right. I want you to put a pitcher in your left. Where is our artillery? Where are the things that we're going to fight with? Where are the things that we're going to throw at them at least to take some of them out? No, all I want you guys to do is to put a trumpet in your right hand and a pitcher in your left. I need you to understand something about that. Because you must understand, brothers and sisters, whenever a trumpet was sounded, especially back in those days, and you've probably seen movies, whenever the trumpet blasts off and that sound begins to pierce the airwaves, that lets everybody know the battle is on. The battle is about to begin. And so now Gideon takes his trumpet out and he blows his trumpet and all the rest of them blow their trumpet as well. The Bible says they had the pitchers and all of them broke the pitchers. Oh, you must understand something about the pitchers. Because the pitcher is this. It used to hold water, but they, they held inside of the pitcher a candlestick. Because it was designed to light their way. So if they lost their way, they could easily find their way because they had a torch, a light that would guide them in the direction, brothers and sisters, that they need to go in. It typifies Christ, who is the light of our world. And if anybody at any given moment, at any given time, lose their way when they're enraged in a battle, there is no way possible that they are going to not find their way because Jesus has already told us that he is the way. And so they broke the picture. And in the text, in the scripture, whenever there was a breaking of the pitcher, that means somebody is about to die. And of course, it was the people of God that were about to die. It was the enemies of God that were about to die. And so when they broke those pitchers, all oh, y'all here, church, they were so ready to do God's business until it made no difference who were coming up against them or not. They knew that the battle had already been won because the Lord had told them, I've already delivered the Midianites into your hands. Are y'all here, church? And this is good news for you and I, church, because every time we go up against an enemy of God, we got to remember that the battle is not ours. The battle belongs to the Lord. I just got to walk according to the will and the ways of the Lord, and the Lord will fight my battle. And I just need to stand and let him do it. So they were ready, church. 300 men were ready to go up against 135 men because they understood that God had already seen to it that they would be the victorious people and they would not be the victims. Are y'all here at church? Praise the Lord. So, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, with an indisputable mindset, Gideon and his army realized that God with them. And I want to encourage any person in here today that might know something about Jesus, even if you don't know him the way he really wants you to know him, the Lord is with you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to care for you. He's going to be your peace. He's going to be your strong tower. He's going to be your mighty battle axe. He's going to be your hope. He's going to be your joy. He's going to be any and everything to you that he has promised to be to you if you just trust him. Come on, give God a hand of praise in here. Praise the Lord. But you got to trust him. Tell somebody the slaughter was in sight. I need to take my time with this because I need you to understand what's going on. 
Because in Judges, the seventh chapter, verse number 25, the Bible says the first people that they took were the princes of Midianite, or the, of, of, of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. Now, Oreb's name means raven. And, 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 and Zeb name means wolf. These were fighters. See, anybody that was a prince, a king, like David was, these were fighters. These were warriors, church. Do y'all hear me? These guys weren't in position just because they were picked to be in a position. They had to be proven to be in a position. Are y'all here? Praise the Lord. And see, God will prove you to see whether or not you are in place for the position that he has chosen for your life. Are y'all here, church? So these guys, brothers and sisters, they were so against the things of God that they were now the princes of the Midianites. And so the Bible says that after a little time, we're talking about 300 men, and all of these people that were against God, the Bible said, check, that they eventually brought the head of Zeb and Odeb to Gideon. That sounds dangerous. That sounds like a lot of fighting was going on. It's kind of like David when he brought the head of Goliath to God. See, they weren't playing. And see, there was a reason why the head had to be cut off. Because anytime the head is cut off, that means the body can't function properly the way it should. And that's why you have to protect the head. That's why you got to care for the head. That's why you have to make sure that the head is in place. Because if the head is ever cut off, the body is destroyed. Are oh, y'all here, church? And so this is the reason why church, they, they brought to them, see what we've done. That gave them more encouragement to know that if they've been able to kill and slaughter the princes, we can forget the rest of the platoon. We know if we got the hair on the princes' heads. These guys were bad. See, they weren't playing like sometimes we do, you must understand. These guys were so strong about what they were involved in. And what no, they realized that their capability with God was so, I mean, out of this world until they knew they can get it done. Brothers and sisters, I want to help you to understand something. Your strength is made perfect when you find out that you're weak. Because whenever you find out that you're weak and now you rely upon the power and the strength of God, that's when you're made strong. See, in other words, you got to get out of you. You got you to get out of what you think you are able to do. Let God build this house. Let God build you up. Let God make you to be who he has called you to be. These guys knew that God was with them. And I want to encourage every single soul out there to stop relying on yourself. Stop trusting in who you are. Stop trusting in your education. Stop trusting in your capabilities. Stop trusting in, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And see, that's what these guys were doing. They didn't know how to go up against 135 men, but God knew how. God knew what it was going to take. So let's check this out. Look at Judges 8, chapter verse number 4. Because you need to see the strength of these men. The Bible says, and Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and 300 men that were with him, listen, they were fainting, yet the Bible said, they were pursuing them. That lets you and I know something. In this war that we are a part of, church, 
there's going to be times that I'm going to get tired. There's going to be times that you're going to get tired. Especially when you war on behalf of the Lord. Especially when you're fighting because of a purpose. Especially when you have destination in your heart. Especially when you know that God is leading you somewhere. There are times that you're going to get tired. But don't let your tiredness cause you to become tight. Tighten up on God. Tighten up on the ways of God. Tighten up on the things of God. God says, listen, although you might get tired and you feel like fainting, keep pursuing. Keep going after him. Keep going after it. Keep going after whatever God has given you to go after. But you're going to get tired. I don't know of any time in my life, especially being in the pastorate now for 23 years just about, there have been so many days I've been tired. But you still pursue. You still go forward. You still go after God. You still go and serve God. You still go do what God has called you to do. These men were fainting, the Bible says, brothers and sisters. And let me tell you this. Sometimes, church, you're going to get tired with life. You're going to get tired of life. You're going to feel like fainting. You're going to feel like falling out. You're going to feel like falling out the, with the person around you. You're going to get tired. You're going to hurt. You're going to feel the pain. It's not going to feel good to you. You want people to be with you. That's not with you. That's not rolling with you. You're going to feel like fainting. But trust me, brothers and sisters, do like these guys did. Feel the faint. But keep pursuing. Feel the lack, but keep pursuing. Feel like you can't get it done, but keep pursuing. Tell somebody to keep pursuing. Keep going after it. You have to, because that's a mindset. And see, the Midianites that's around you and I every single day don't want us to hold fast to that mindset. They want us to give up. They want you to quit. They want you to throw in a towel, deacon. They want you to shut it down. They don't want you to keep moving forward. But the Bible said they, they, they were faint. Yet, they pursued. These men were strong on the inside. It's not about how many muscles and how much you can bench press and how much you can leg press. That's good. I believe in physical fitness. But what's going on on the inside? That makes the difference in order for you to be able to do what's necessary on the outside. Because if you're not strong on the inside, you can fit, forget what God wants you to do on the outside. You got to be built up on the inside. Look what Paul said. Paul said it like this. Though my outward man perish. Day by day, my inward man is being renewed. That's the part that I got to make sure I pay attention to. That's the part that I need to pour into in order for my inward man to be made strong. That's why I pray. That's why I fast. That's why I study. That's why I give. That's why I submit. That's why I do those things. Because I want my inward man to be made whole. I know I'm leaving here, but my inward man is going to eternity. Are y'all here, church? So I need to pay attention to that part of my life versus being so cracked up over this part. These men were strong. Are y'all here, church? These men were strong. And see, it's imperative for you to understand that Gideon wasn't satisfied. They had the princes. They had both princes, brothers and sisters, but, but Gideon was not satisfied. And I want to encourage anyone who has now gotten to a point in their lives where they, they're comfortable. I don't think no person that served the Lord Jesus should ever, ever, ever get comfortable. Because as soon as you get comfortable, watch for the craziness to go forward. 
I'm going to say that one more time for this crowd. And as soon as you get comfortable, watch for the craziness to break out. As soon as you get comfortable, watch for all hell to break loose. Because we were never designed to get comfortable. We were never designed to get comfortable. We were designed to fight the good fight of faith. Watch this. Because they already got the princes. But now, we still have the prince. But you know there's somebody above the princes? The kings. You can't stop at the lower level of that enemy that's going up against you and think it's over. Because sometimes you fight against an enemy and you think he's been defeated and there are no more. Oh, there's some more. Your battle is not over. Listen, my fight after 23 years is not over. I know I have some more enemies in my future that I have to go up against. That's why I need to prepare now in my present to make sure I can handle those enemies in my future. Are y'all here, church? Because if you don't prepare yourself now for what it is you're dealing with, you're going to be defeated up there. We said that before, am I right? So we got some kings. How many of y'all like the game of chess? There's a strategy in the game of chess. You're on one side, your opponent is on the other side. The whole strategy is for you to make sure you make the right moves. Take the right steps. Do the right things mentally while your opponent is thinking in one way, you got to be thinking two, three, four steps ahead because your enemy is trying to take you out. And so you're trying to get and maneuver yourself all the way to the other side so you can call checkmate. Because once checkmate takes place, that means your enemy cannot move to the left, can't move to the right, can't do anything at all but stay there and you take him over. And so here Gideon, in my opinion, was playing the game of chess with the Midianites. So there's King Ziba, whose name means sacrifice. And Zumula, whose name, check this, name means uh deprived from shade. I think he was as dark as dark can be. Solid black man. Deprived from shade. Are y'all here? And here this man is. You know, you know how y'all are afraid of these big black people. Some of the other folk are really afraid, right? You're hiding your purses, you're hiding everything. Well, these were some guys, these were kings. And here they are, Gideon says, I'm going to cross this Jordan. I'm going to get right over there, and we're going to take them out as well. The Bible says in Judges 8, verse number 21, check it out. Gideon slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took the ornament that were on their camel's neck. See, this was payback time. I want to ask you a question. Do you want to pay that enemy back and get some things back from what he has taken from you? Do you recall in chapter number 6 and chapter number 7? Every I see you there, deaconess. I see you. I, I got you. I'm with you. And so every time you must understand that the Israelites planted something. The Bible says the Midianites came and took it up. Every time they sowed, they came right back and took it up. They pitched a tent, they took the tent. They had some cattle, they took the cattle. They planted some vineyards, they took the vineyards. That's how the enemy would do. The, the enemy's job is to steal, kill, and to this. He want to take stuff from you. He want to take your love life. He want to take your joy. He want to take your peace. He won't take your hope. 
He won't take your tomorrow. He won't take your future. You know, so we're not having this anymore. Tell somebody, he, we're not having this anymore. And so here they are. They go up against the kings, church. Somebody did kings. They go up against the kings, and next thing you know, they're next. Gone. Now I'm getting closer to my message. Because at this point here, church, everybody is cool. They've been up against 135,000 soldiers with 300. We know God is with us. We know God's hands have been upon us. We know there is no way possible we could have done what we've done except for the Lord being with us. But something happened. Church, instead of the Israelites wanting God to rule, they looked to the man that helped them to navigate through all that they went through. They wanted him to rule. They wanted his grandson to rule. They wanted his sons to rule. Gideon said, no, God will be your ruler. That was good, but it was not. It's dangerous, church, for us. Whenever we've been through a battle, remember what the scripture said? For 40 years, they were in captivity, so to speak, for seven. And now for 40 years, they've had no disruption, interruption from the Midianites. Life was good. Life was on the easy street. Things were fine. And so many times in our own personal life, just when everything is fine, just when everything seemed to be just good, I'm living my best life in this life. And everything was good. You hear me what I'm saying? Now they want, instead of God being their Lord, now they want the man of God to be their Lord. Gideon said no. That was a good move, but it wasn't over. It was amazing to me when I was studying. I was like, wow. Look at what's going on at this point next. Because the next thing that's happening, brothers and sisters, is... The Lord helps us to understand a fall of Gideon. This man just took out a whole, I mean, a group of men. But now here come the turn. The turn came, brothers and sisters, check this out. When he asked the soldiers to give me an earring from each of those that you plunder, about 43 pounds of gold earrings. Now the Israelites have already had problems a long time ago with gold, shiny stuff, bright stuff. They went right back to where God had And not only that, remember, they had already been in a land where idolatry is practiced. And so when they did that, the Bible says Gideon did it. He made an ephod of gold. Now an ephod, brothers and sisters, is a priestly garment. It's what the priests wear. And priests put the garments on because, again, it's for them to go and do service on behalf of the Lord. With This is what they use. They put these things on when they go into the temple to offer up sacrifice on behalf of God's people. In the temple, on behalf of God's people. But if you look at the text, the Bible says that Gideon brought 
the ephod of gold and put it into the city. So people could go to the shrine, if you will. So people could go up to the place of idolatry and worship the ephod. Instead of worshiping God. And so many people today are out there still worshiping the ephod. They don't want to worship God. It's amazing. It's amazing how many people really don't want anything to do with the true and the living. Let me just go to some resemblance, some thing that look kind of close to him, and I'll be good, Bishop. I'll be okay. No, no, there's only but one God. And God says, I thou shall not have no other God before me. And they go out there. Are you hearing me? And the Bible said that the, the Israelites played the harlot with the ephod. You know what playing the harlot is? Fondling playing around with, you know, being swung by. Just, you know what I'm saying? They played the harlot with the ephod. Now, God had just delivered them. God just brought them out. God just made a way for them. God just did great things for them, just like he do for us. We see his hand. We know that he's in place. We know his mercy. We know his strength. And then we go right back. Brothers and sisters, Gideon was doing good. He avoided the temptation when it came to the people saying to him, hey, we want you to rule us. That was temptation. They have done all this. You know, that's tempting. Am I right? Could you imagine being in that position yourself as a man, as a woman, and hear people around you want you to, you know, go on and praise the Lord? Say, listen here, we want you to rule over us now. That's tempting. He didn't yield, but it wasn't over. And brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, listen. Whenever you've done well, watch yourself because that enemy wants you to think that you're more than who you are called to be and you got to watch it see that that goes for me check it that goes for you that goes for any of us that goes for all of us because you've killed out 135 men with 300 now you're somebody special you're somebody with some clout. Everybody knows Gideon's name. Everyone knows him. And Gideon, because of comfort, kind of like what David did, because of comfort, he does the same thing. Don't ever get comfortable, church. So the scripture says, I'm about to close. The scripture says they played the harlot with the bells, and then I would say they went backwards. My word of encouragement to every person in here on this morning is this. When you've defeated that bell in your life, don't go backwards. God brought you forward for a reason. And though you may not understand what the future holds for you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of your future. Don't be afraid of what you hadn't seen. Connect, as a matter of fact, in the spirit realm because you hadn't seen it. I'm familiar with my past. You're familiar with your past. But don't let your past drag you back. Because anytime you are thinking more about your past than you are thinking about your future, you're being drugged. That's why Israel was called backsliders. They constantly went back. Over and over again, they went back. Constantly. The 
good news is God is married to the backslider. But he never wants us to stay backsliders. Israel had become backslidden. So, the scripture tells us, brothers and sisters, that the, the Gideon died. When Gideon died, all they were thinking about, because the man that was holding something together was no longer in the picture. You know, death can be a good thing. Death can also be a bad thing for those that are remaining. Remember what happened to Peter? As soon as Jesus died, Peter went back fishing again. And so many times, families that were closely knitted together, hold, I mean, because of the people that were in place, when that one person dies, when that glues dies, it seems like people just go crazy. Just go doing, I'm talking about the wild thing. They just do the wild thing. Just do whatever they want to do. But you know what this is putting you in. You know what this is all about. You know the direction that you were taught. You know these things. Bible says, as soon as Gideon died, boy, everything just went off. They just went right back. So, three ways to keep from going back real quickly, real quickly. Three ways to keep yourself from going backwards after God has moved you forward. Three things real quickly. Write this down. One, bow often to God. Bow often to God. Bow often. Bow often to God. It's going to help you. Prayer is so critical in your life. Bow often to God. Find it time. Find time. Find space. Find those moments. Find um, Just bow often. As often as you can. It's going to help your heart. It's going to cause you to depend more on the Lord. Amen. Keep your beliefs high. You got to keep your faith up. Tell somebody, you got to keep your faith up. You bow down, keep your faith up. You bow down, you keep your faith up. You bow down, you keep your faith up. Your beliefs go high. I got to trust in him when I can't see him. I got to trust in him when I can't trace him. I got to trust him if I don't understand him. I got to trust him. You got to keep your beliefs high. And see, the only way that it happens is situations like this right here, you know, Coming into the sanctuary helps to, you to keep your beliefs high. And the last thing, as I close, be brave and break it. You got to be brave enough to break it. Every hang up, all of these, all of those things that's going on in your life, you got to be brave enough to break those chains, break those strongholds, break those habits, because you have everything inside of you to do it, but it's up. Amen. God bless you. I'm done. Everyone standing, please. You know, we now we're in day 20 of our consecration. Tomorrow is 21. On a personal level, I know that God has done some great things in my life. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> I mean, without a doubt. 21 days of this, yes. God has done some great things in my life. Anyone else that has participated, I honestly believe God has done some great things in your life as well. You can't go through a time of consecration, a time of prayer and fasting, and God not perform what he promised he would perform. You can't. Here is the deal. On Tuesday, things sort of go back, we'll go back to normal. Kind of like what happened here after the battle, because let me tell you what, fasting is a time of affliction. That's what the Bible says. It's a time of affliction. 
after the battle, we go back to comfort. But don't go back to comfort. Go, don't go back the same way you came in. We came in from the holidays in. Don't go back and get back on holiday mode. Now, because of the word, remember what Jesus said? This kind go not out but by prayer and fasting. Now it's time to go to work. Now it's time to get the job done. Now we've emptied ourselves from ourselves, and because of that, it's time for us now to get in place so we can run this race that has been set before us for 2022. He's still about building a better you, a better you, a better you in 2022. But we can't do like this Gideon army. We can't do like the Israelites. We can't forget. Don't forget. Tell someone, don't forget. Let's not go backwards. Let's make every step we take, every move we make, let's make it better, let's make it bigger, let's make it to, I mean, so we can accomplish what we need to accomplish all to the glory of God. Young people, while you, when you go back to school, let your light so shine. Don't let it become dim. Let your light shine. Let our relationships shine. Let our walk amongst those that don't know him yet, let it shine. We've been given this tool, this treasure, the Bible says, in earthen vessels, that the excellency would be not of us, but of God. If anyone is going to see excellence, yes, they're going to see it in our lives and through our lives, but it's all pointing to one, toward the one that made our lives. Let's give our God a hand of praise, church. I, I pray that you guys got something out of this.